Good morning, and welcome to Lisbon Falls Baptist Church. We're so excited that you've chosen to join us this morning. If we couldn't meet in person, we can meet in video, and we just pray that you would just bring your heart ready to worship and sing praises to our God and King. First, we're going to start off with Love Lifted Me. years, even in uncertain times, great is his faithfulness. Spring 
of that great faithfulness that we can overcome. Jesus, 
comes at us in this life, we know that we can rely on you because you are faithful. We love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, Lisbon Falls Baptist Church and all of our friends, family members, and fellow believers all around the globe that, uh, that may partake in watching this with us today. We're thrilled to have you, and wow, what an awesome song for us to sing in times like this. We've got the coronavirus we're dealing with. Maybe it's a health issue. Maybe God's testing your faith in another way, and we're reminded that we overcome through Jesus Christ, right? Jesus has overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of his testimony. And so praise God. Thank you for those. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed singing. And now I'm going to invite you in a few moments. We'll get to the book of Luke, and so you can either take your iPad, uh, maybe you're next to a computer, uh, maybe you have a screen and screen on your TV, uh, or actually, old school, which is what I'm doing, a Bible. And uh, you can open it up to the book of Luke, chapter 22. We'll be there in just a few moments. But a couple of announcements just kind of wanted to make. This is obviously our first time doing something like this, and probably the first time for most of you. I've never done church before like I'm going to do it with my family. And I'm imagining most of you are in the same boat that we're in. So just a couple of announcements. If you get a chance and you're watching this on YouTube and you have an account, why don't you like our channel? Uh, that'll help you. Uh, that way, when we upload videos uh, down the future, you can check it out whenever those become available. Uh, the second thing is, uh, go to our Facebook page. Uh, for those of you from the church, Lisbon Falls Baptist Church, we'll have announcements on there as well as our website. But if you can really click on YouTube and the subscription, that'd be great because that'll help you and that will help us. A couple of other things, there'll be some announcements that were on there before. For those from our church uh, that want to give their tithe or offering, just go on Tithely and look for Lisbon Falls Baptist Church. And if there's somebody else out there and, and God leads you in that way, you're welcome to join in there as well. Any other questions for folks from our church, please contact myself. And there's really only three people here today. God is here with us, and it's me and Pastor Giuliani. He's back there doing the hard work. Uh, he's doing all the videoing and editing. And so I want to thank him for all of his hard work uh, doing this. And, and we pray that it comes to you in an excellent way, and we're able to minister God's word to you. But if we can be of any service to you as pastors and deacons during this time, please let us know. We're here to serve you. We're here to love you and care for the flock in a different way than we've ever had to do before. So if you have your Bible, I invite you to turn to the book of Luke, chapter 22. We're going to do a little bit of background, um, a little bit of review. This week, we're talking about the Son of God must suffer many things, part two. And so I understand you know, some of you maybe haven't been able to be at church in a while, and so that you're going to kind of be catching up. But where we're at, as a church, we've been working through the book of Luke now for about 16 months. And we're getting ready to finish right around Easter. And we'll see what the Lord does. But chances are we'll probably be finishing as we are right now. And so if you'd like to catch up with us, you could, you're going to have some time. I'm sure most of you the next couple of weeks, you could read through the book of Luke. Um, or just uh, read through chapter 22 and into chapter 23 next week because we're very quickly heading to the death of Christ and then the resurrection at Easter. And so I'd like to say something to the kids that are with us today. Um, I'm sure there's kids sitting there. My own children will be sitting there. Uh, maybe you've got grandkids with you or gathering as a family. I'd encourage you, if you can find a blank sheet of paper like the one I have here, especially children maybe under the age of you know, 10 or so that might not uh, be into taking notes yet. Uh, some of the older kids and my kids, I'd like to encourage to be taking notes. But... You know, some of you might not be ready for that. And so if you're not ready for that, um, have them grab a sheet of paper. And maybe they can start drawing out a garden. Because we're going to be in the Garden of Gethsemane. And Jesus dealing with Peter and the other disciples. Um, it would be a great opportunity for them to feel part of this. And even though we're not able to gather together as a body, we can gather as a body and know that there's other people in our church and other people around the world. Maybe some of our missionaries joining us. That we're all able to spend time together in God's word from separate locations. What a blessing. Jesus said, right, where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there in their midst. And so we thank him for that today. 
So if you've got your Bibles with you, Luke chapter 22 is where we're at, and we're going to start in verse 47. Just a little bit of a background. This message kind of has a double title, if you will. Last week, where we were at, is we talked about the Son of Man must suffer many things, and that was message number 51. So if you can imagine, we've been at it year, you know, for a year, basically 51 messages. Um, and what we're going to look at today is we're going to talk about the idea of Jesus, the miracle and the master, a tale of two trials, Peter and Jesus. And so really what we're going to deal with today is we're going to see Jesus and Peter kind of on the, the same line, if you will, but answering and doing things in a completely different way. Jesus, as God, is going to pass every temptation. He already has. He's, he's just come through the temptation, and, and he says, if you remember last week, he says, Father, if there's any other way, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. And he's made several prophecies. He made a prophecy back in Luke chapter 22, looking in my Bible, right in the Lord's table, he'll say, look, one of you is, is going to betray me. And guess what happens? The disciples are worried about it for a second, and then they have the argument that we've probably all had, which is, hey, I wonder which one of us is the greatest. And Jesus sets them straight on that issue. And then he turns to Peter, and he says, look, Peter, you're going to deny me. And Jesus is very specific about that denying of him. He's going to tell Peter that not only is Peter going to deny, deny him, but he's going to deny that he even knew Jesus. And unfortunately, but in reality, we're going to see that played out before us today. And so, you know, you might say to yourself, what in the world does this passage have to do with what's going on in our world? Well, I think maybe a lot more than we might realize. First off, as we come in, we're going to be reminded of God's providence. And so if you're taking notes, that's really the first thought today. I'll give it to you, and then we'll read the text, and then just kind of work through it together. The providence of God and Peter's denial, chapter 22, verses 47 to 62. And so if you will, just join with me. Actually, even at home, if you want, you could read this out loud as a family as I read it. And then we're going to come back and just kind of work through it. So Luke chapter 22, verse 47 says this. While Jesus was still speaking, there came a crowd, and the man called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He drew near to Jesus to kiss him, but Jesus said to him, Judas, would you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? And when those were around him saw that, they would follow and said, Lord, shall we strike with a sword? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his right ear. But Jesus said, no more of this. And he touched his ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests and officers of the temple and elders who had come out against him, have you come out against a robber with swords and clubs? When I was with you day after day in the temple, you did not lay hands on me, but this is your hour, the power of darkness. And I think for now we'll just stop there and come back to that next section because Luke really gives us a good picture here of what's going on. So a couple reminders about Luke. He's a doctor. And way, way back in chapter 1, for those that are joining us today, and a good reminder for all of us, in Luke chapter 1, he reminds us why he wrote the book. The Holy Spirit inspires this. This is God's word. But Luke says this. He says, listen, inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us. It seemed good to me, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus. And so Luke is very orderly about how he writes things. Now that doesn't mean that Matthew and Mark and John aren't, but each of the Gospels give us a picture of Christ. Matthew reminds us that Jesus is the king. Mark reminds us Jesus is the servant. Luke reminds us Jesus is a man, and John reminds us that Jesus is God. And so where we're at in the, book of the, in the book of Luke, Jesus is fulfilling the three offices that were prophesied of him in the Old Testament. First, that he is the king. Second, that he is the prophet that was promised. And finally, that he is the final high priest. And you'll kind of see that today. So what we see here in the text, if you look at your Bible down in verse 47, is we see a couple of things. Jesus sort of is outlined for us by Luke that, first of all, Jesus knew Judas would betray him. He already prophesied that. We're going to see that prophecy come true in just a moment. Jesus had compassion for people in the midst of sorrow. Wow, there's a great application for us, isn't there? There's a lot of people that are very angst. Maybe you are. are very worried about this COVID-19. And, and I think rightfully so. This is serious stuff, not just here in America, but around the world. People, people are dying. What one of us hasn't been touched by what's going on in Italy? 
What well, one of us doesn't want that here in America? Uh, who, is not, who doesn't know someone that, that is working in the medical field? And so we need to have compassion for people around us. As Christians, that's, that's why we're left here. We're left to love and to care for people. And so not only that, we're going to see Jesus knew Judas would betray him. We're going to see Jesus had compassion. But we're also going to see Jesus is really going to point to the hypocrisy of the religious leaders. And so if you look at your text of scripture, you'll notice just a couple of things that, that might help in the background. First of all, Matthew and Mark tell us that the kiss that Judas is going to give was a prearranged marker to whom they were known that they were supposed to take away. Now, at least as an American... I always thought it was kind of odd that Judas used a kiss to betray Jesus. And, and to be honest with you, until about a week ago, I really just figured it was kind of like some weird Jewish thing. But I never really considered the fact that it's late at night. It's very hard to know who is who. They're in a garden. They're in Gethsemane. And, you know, most of them had beards. They probably maybe even had their heads covered. And so it wasn't very easy to tell who was who. Uh, it's not like they had electricity like we have today. You know, they probably had some, uh, you know, maybe a, a few torches or something like that. And so the point here is simply this, that Mark and Matthew will remind us that this was prearranged. Now, Luke just assumes that you and I know that. Also, the darkness would have made it really tough to tell which Galilean was Jesus and which one was Peter. And so Judas, knowing this, and God providentially behind all of this, working out his spider web, if you will, because he's in control, Judas comes in, and the Bible tells us right here in verse 47, while Jesus was speaking. So remember, he's talking to his disciples. They had just fallen asleep. He told them, hey, guys, stay awake. This is our moment of testing. This is our moment of trial. It says, the man called Judas was leading them. He drew near to Jesus in verse 47. But Jesus said to him, Judas, would you betray the son of man with a kiss? And so the Lord, knowing that this was going to happen, still gives Judas one more chance. And oh, friends, isn't that like our Lord, that even in the midst of his greatest day, if you will, the death and, and, and the subsequent resurrection. Now, remember, this is the late Thursday night. We're moving into Friday, what we know is Good Friday. And yet he gives Judas one more chance. Oh, don't you love that about our God, that he loves you and that, you know what, you can never out sin him. You can never outrun him. He will always chase you down. I think it's Spurgeon that said, God always gets his man. Amen to that. Amen to that. As we always say to our church, and all God's people said, I'll give you a moment if you know it. We always say, and all God's people said, amen. All right? So, now the Bible goes on here. In verse 48, it says, but Jesus said to him, Judas, would you betray with a kiss? And when those who were around saw, they would follow. They said, Lord, shall we strike? And so, what we learn from other gospels is we learn in the book of John that this wasn't just a disciple that cut off Jesus' ear. Yep, if you didn't know, you guessed it. It was Peter. John will tell us that Peter's the one that cuts Jesus' ear off. Now, Luke doesn't tell us that. If you look at the text, Luke says, And one of them struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. Now, now what's interesting here is for as we've been working through the book of Luke, as best I know how, and it's not perfect, but I've been trying to track how many times does Jesus do a miracle? Something that you would not normally see. So, for instance, when have you seen someone feed 5,000? I've never seen that. Or when have you seen someone raise a little girl from the dead? Or when have you seen someone who couldn't walk and they were now, you know, able to walk again? Or who do you know that walks on the water, right? Something that's really, it just doesn't happen. It's, it's, you can't explain it. It's a miracle, right? It's something that only God can do. And so we've seen 22 times, get my numbers right, and now we're going to see the 23rd specific miracle. Now, to be honest with you, there were a lot more, but I'm talking specific ones that were delineated in the Bible. There's many times in the book of Luke where it'll say Jesus healed all the diseases. Well, we don't know how many there were. But of each time where it's specific, it will say he raised a girl from the dead or he walked in the water. We've seen 22 miracles, and we're in chapter 22. So pretty much a miracle a chapter. Now some chapters might contain five or six or others might not have any. But if you track it chronologically, now this is our 23rd miracle. And so look at it. The Bible says in verse 51, Jesus said, no more of this. And that reminds us where we were at last week, right? When the disciples said, hey, Lord, we've got two swords. And he says, uh, it's enough. Not that he necessarily wanted them to bring them, but Jesus wasn't going 
to conquer Rome as the disciples thought or even the rest of the Jews thought. He was there to conquer our sins. He was there to receive the wrath of God. He is the Lamb of God who will take away the sins of the world. And so, do you find this amazing, brothers and sisters? I don't know if anybody's ever, if you will, proverbially stabbed you in the back or you felt that somebody cheated on you or I, I've even done that to people where, where we say something we shouldn't or can you imagine the love of Christ here that one of the men that he'd spent three years with kissed him and gave him away, kissed him on the cheek, gave him away and then Peter cuts off the ear of one of these people that's there, he's ready to go to war and Jesus takes that ear, however mangled it was, and puts it back on. Incredible, right? Another miracle. And so the Bible goes on here and says, Then Jesus said to the chief priests and officers of the temple who'd come out against him, Have you come out against a robber? So just a little review as to what we've seen so far. First, we saw Jesus knew Judas would betray him. Another reminder that he is the prophet. Moses had said, A prophet will arise who's greater than I. That's the Lord Jesus. He is Yeshua. He's the Messiah. He's the Christ. As I remind our church a lot, Jesus simply means Savior. Christ simply means King. Now, they can both mean a few other things, but in his very name, Jesus, Savior, Christ, King. He's the Savior, King. And so, he's the prophet. He is the King. He'll, we'll find that out a little bit later. And then he's also the priest, which we'll see in just a few moments. So, Jesus knew Judas would betray him. He had compassion for people in the midst of sorrow. And then finally, Jesus ultimately now is going to point to the hypocrisy of the religious leaders. Look at these last two verses in this section. Have you come out against a robber with swords and clubs? When I was with you day after day in the temple, you did not lay hands on me. But this is your hour, the power of darkness. And so ultimately, brothers and sisters, as we kind of close this particular section, and we'll pick up in just a moment in verse 54, what we're reminded of here is Jesus calls out the hypocrisy of the religious leaders. How many times did they have him in the temple? Day by day he was in the temple. And it's interesting because if you go to Luke's second volume, the book of Acts, you'll note that that's what the disciples did when they became apostles, the apostles. What did they do? Day by day they stayed in the temple and in their homes. Luke chapter 22 and verse 54 down through 62 will be the next section we'll deal with. And this deals with the faith, faithlessness of Peter and the faithfulness of Christ. Kind of in a larger way, it really um, reminds us ultimately of what, what Peter failed at. And it's a good reminder to us at times that we failed. So let's look at what the Bible says. Then they seized him, this is Jesus, and led him away, bringing him into the high priest's house. And Peter was following at a distance. And when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat down among them. Then a servant girl, seeing him as he sat in the light, looked closely at him and said, this man was also with him. But he denied it, saying, Woman, I don't know him. And a little later, someone else saw him and said, You also are one of them. But Peter said, Man, I'm not. And after an interval of about an hour, insisted again, saying, Certainly, this man was also with him too. I'm sure he's a Galilean. But Peter said, Man, I do not know what you're talking about. And immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter and Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, how he had said to him, before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went and wept bitterly. It's a tough passage. This is a tough text because it's easy to be really hard on Peter. But how many times have I been like Peter? How many times have you? How many times have I failed the Lord? Or have I had a chance to witness? Or have I said, God, I won't do this again. And I fail. And so honestly, at least for me, I'm more like Peter than I'd like to admit. And yet we see the Lord's graciousness and compassion. Before we get there, a couple of things that we need to be reminded of. Jesus is getting ready to go into a, a multitude of trials. In fact, we're not going to see all of them in Luke, but if you were to take Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you'll see six trials that Jesus goes through. Several of them with the Jews and several with the Romans. And part of the reason for that is the Jews literally could not kill Jesus because they were not in charge. The Romans had to. And so the Jews will finally, we'll see a little bit of it today, they finally get to the point where they can't go any further and they appeal to the Romans. And so before we get to that section, it's just good to be reminded of that. Matthew and John will also remind us that Caiaphas is the high priest. 
You might be familiar with him back in Luke chapter 3, verse 2, and 4, 6, he's mentioned. But Luke won't mention him here, but that's who he's talking about. We're also told that Peter follows at a distance. And so one of the things we see is, as we're moving through here, Peter's kind of the only one. And so even though Peter's given a really, you know, he does kind of get a bad name, if you will, because he denies the Lord here. I think one of the redeeming qualities of Peter is he just didn't give up. The idea we understand from the rest of the disciples is they scattered. But Peter, he was committed. He wanted to stay, and he did. And yes, he failed, but he stayed. Now, a couple of other thoughts as you work through the text. It's interesting what what Peter will say, and I'm just going to read to you right from the text of Scripture. There's kind of a, a little bit of a progression, and Peter is very clear. If you note, for instance, down in verse 56, he's asked by the servant girl, you were with him, and Peter says, woman, I don't know him. So not only does Peter deny Jesus, but he denies that he even knew who Jesus was. And then if you go down a little later, it'll say in 50, 58, the, this man will say, hey, you were with him. And Peter will say, no, I'm not. I'm not one of his disciples. So he denies that he knew Jesus. He denies that he was one of the disciples. He denies even being with him. And then later, finally, Peter says, man, I do not know what you're talking about. And the part I think that just grips your heart for Peter and for each of us is Jesus is getting ready to go through, if you will, the greatest day between Friday and Sunday, Good Friday, where he'll purchase salvation for us on the cross. But interestingly enough here, it says, after Peter said, verse 60, this is the verse, but Peter said, man, I do not know what you're talking about. And immediately, while he was speaking, so imagine, Peter's saying, I don't know what you're talking about, and you hear that rooster crow. Just let that silence hit you for a minute. As Peter's talking, the rooster crows. And have you ever been in that moment, right, where somebody catches you or you say something? I've done it way too many times. And all of a sudden you realize, oh, no, what was I thinking? I shouldn't have done that. And so you can really empathize with Peter here because now, you know, it says, and Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, how he had said to him, before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. Now, friends, one of the differences between Peter and Judas is this. Immediately after that, it says, and Peter went out and wept bitterly. That word bitterly means almost aggressively. In other words, he was absolutely broken. Peter understood what he had done. He denied the Lord. And yet we're reminded this prophecy again is fulfilled Jesus is the prophet, he is the priest, and he is the king. And so it's, it's a hard section, but it's a great reminder of God's goodness, of his compassion. And for those of us that were here last week, Jesus, in his prophecy, had also said that Peter will come back. And so we'll see Peter come back, and he becomes a different guy when you get to the book of Acts. Almost like something changed. Well, it did. Peter was now Jesus' man. And so what a wonderful thing. But at this time, Peter's hurting for certain, no doubt. So the text we're in today finishes in chapter 22 this way. It's starting in verse 63. It says, Now the men who were holding Jesus in custody were mocking him as they beat him. They also blindfolded him and kept asking, Prophesy, who is it that struck you? And they said many other things, blaspheming him. And so now we see Jesus fulfilling all the prophecies he'd given all through the book of Luke, saying the Son of Man must be taken away, he must be beaten, he must be mocked. All of those things are starting to happen. And so you can just see, almost like a spider web, prophecies popping up all over the scripture. We think of Isaiah 53, the suffering servant. We think of way back in Genesis chapter 3, that the Bible says that he will crush your head, but you will bruise his heel. And so now Jesus is delivering the final blow to Satan, to sin and death. But He's becoming sin for me. He's becoming sin for you. He who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And so those hits he he was taking, I deserved. Jesus didn't lie, I did. Jesus didn't sin, I did. And so the scripture tells us here that not only that, but they're, they're making fun of the fact that he can prophesy. Well, if you're a prophet, prophesy who hit you. As if he couldn't, he wouldn't. Because the Bible tells us like a lamb to the slaughter. As a sheep goes before the shears, so he was silent. And so it's almost like there's prophecies within the prophecy that are coming out all over the scripture. You can kind of see it just like boom, boom, boom. You know, it's it's incredible 
and yet heart-wrenching because we did this to Christ. It was me that was there. It was you. And so the Bible doesn't stop there. It finishes in chapter 22. When day came. So now, here's a reminder. This is the end of Thursday night. We're now on what we know as Good Friday, right? I think three weeks from today. And so when day came, the assembly of the elders and the people gathered together, both the chief priests and the scribes. Now remember, this is not uncommon in Luke. There's always a crowd. Jesus is a rock star. Everybody's following him. He's doing miracles. But now the crowd has changed. They're not following him. They're here to take him out. The religious leaders, they're here to get their way. They don't know that God is using them to fulfill his ultimate plan of salvation. But they want this guy out of the way. He's in the way, and they're going to get him out of the way. And so it says the chief priests and scribes, they led him away to their council, and they said, if you're the Christ, tell us. How many times had Jesus told them, I'm the Christ? And so he says, I'll tell you, but you will not believe. He had told them a little while ago, if, if the rocks had cried out, you wouldn't believe. And so they still wouldn't believe. And he says, and, and if I ask you, you will not answer. But from now on, the Son of Man, one of the names for Jesus, designating him as the Son of God and the Son of Man, he says, shall be seated at the right hand of the power of God. So there's a reminder for us. Not only is he the prophet, what he said had to be 100% correct. You can't miss once. And Jesus never did. But also, he's the king. And he reminds them, listen, when I raise again from the dead, I'm going to go to heaven and sit at the right hand of my Father. And what a great reminder for you and I in the midst of all the things going on in the world, politically, socially, the social distancing we're all practicing, that you know what? I don't understand it all, but God is on the throne. Jesus sits right next to his heavenly Father. He tells us that right here, awaiting to come get his church. What an awesome reminder, a reminder I need and you need that, you know, even though we don't understand, and we don't know what tomorrow holds. We don't know what today holds, but we know who holds the day. God does. And so Jesus says, look, I'm going to, from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the power of God. So they all said, are you the Son of God then? And he said to them, you say that I am. In other words, he had been telling them that for months. In fact, for three years. And now he says, look, you said it. It's not about saying it. It's about believing it. And so the Bible says here, then they said, what further testimony do we need? We have heard it from his own lips. And so that concludes for us chapter 22. And now we're going to go on for just a moment into chapter 23. We've now seen the abusive treatment of Jesus as the prophet by the Jewish guards. And now we're going to see him handed over to the Romans as well. And so now the Jews have pretty much gotten about as far as they can get, right? They're, just, they're not quite done, but they're just about done. Now they're going to stick with it. But now they're going to go to the highest power of the land, right? really the highest power in the day in the world, and that is the Romans. And so the Bible tells us just a couple of verses as we close today, and then we'll do a little bit of application. So how does this work for us? Then the whole company of them arose and brought him before Pilate, and they began to accuse him, saying, We found this man misleading our nation and forbidding to give tribute to Caesar and saying that he himself is Christ, a king. Now there was a truth and a falsehood there. Jesus had said that he was the Christ and the king, but Jesus had not forbidden giving money to Caesar. If you go back in the book of Luke, Jesus is asked a question at one point, so should we give unto Caesar or should we give unto God? And the Jews are trying to trap him because if Jesus says Caesar, then he's going against his heavenly father and he's going against God. If he says God, he's going against Rome. And Jesus says those famous words, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's and render unto God what is God's. And so there's a lie within here, and we'll see many of them, because ultimately that's how they're going to trap Jesus. And so what we're going to do today is at this point, we're going to stop here, and I'm going to ask you that have joined us today, or maybe down the road, to do some homework, because next week we're going to come back, and we're going to skip a little section, and we're going to, we may touch on it a little bit, but we're going to head to ultimately the mountain of them all, and that is the cross. We'll probably take it for a couple of weeks and work through it, and then we'll, we'll rejoice exceedingly because Easter Sunday, Jesus is going to rise again from the dead. But I think one of the things that we have to ask ourselves is, okay, so how does this apply to you and me? What are some things that we can draw from this particular passage of Scripture? And I'd just like to share a story with you and then a couple of applications. I shared this with many of us last week at Lisbon, and so some of you may know this, but it's a great reminder of why God does allow hard things. 
In the book of James chapter 1, God says that the testing of our faith develops perseverance so we'll be mature and complete. There's a story told of a man who loved butterflies. And one day he was walking along and saw a cocoon with a little uh, stick and it was on there. And so he brought it in his house and watched it for many days. And a few weeks later, finally the cocoon started to shake and shudder. And boy, he was excited. He watched it enraptured by it. And it just kept getting so violent that, you know, he watched it and thought, oh, no, this is not good. And so in in a moment, he went over and grabbed a little, just a a little pair of scissors and just snipped just the edge of it. And all of a sudden, this beautiful butterfly comes out. And he's all excited. I don't know what kind, but let's say it was a monarch maybe. And and the butterfly's there, and he's watching it, and it's spreading its wings, and he's so excited. And, you know, after 10 minutes or so, the butterfly doesn't fly. And the man thinks to himself, well, I'll give it some time, and so an hour goes by, and two, and the butterfly still doesn't fly. So he calls a friend of his that's a school teacher, and uh, teaches science and biology, and asks him, you know what, it, it's not flying, and the man said, well, what happened? And he explained the story, and, and the teacher said, well, oh, no, you didn't cut the edge of it. He said, yeah, I wanted to help him. He said, no. He said, see, it's the struggle that makes the butterfly's wings able to fly. And so I can't make sense of all the things going on in the world around us. I'm sure just like Peter couldn't in the disciples. But I know this. I know God's got this. I know he's got you and I in the palm of his hand. If you don't know Christ, he wants you to know him. That's why he sent his son. But for those of us that do, he cares for you and he loves you. And none of this surprises him. It sure surprises us. It throws us for a loop, but it doesn't surprise him at all. And so here's a couple of applications for you and I to think through this week. First of all, what one of us hasn't denied Christ with our lips and with our life? I I know I have. And if we have, let's pull a Peter. We ask forgiveness. There's compassion, right? God is willing, not that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Jesus is willing to forgive you and me if we're willing to ask, to repent, to turn from our sins, and to turn to him in grace and forgiveness That's why he came. And, you know, kind of like this section here, it kind of reminds me of what we're dealing with today, doesn't it? Jesus now, we've left him today. He's all alone. Peter's not there. John's not there. Maybe that's you or me. I know a lot of us, we're practicing and should be social distancing, right? We feel kind of alone. We, We miss being here and gathering today. And so what a great opportunity for us to be reminded we can do something the disciples couldn't. Uh, We're not all going to court. We're not going to the cross to die. Uh, We're we're, we're just in our homes. We can call somebody. We can send an email. We can show them that we care and that we love them. And so two more things, I think, just to kind of close today. I want to encourage you to check on your neighbors and your friends. Give them a phone call. Uh, Check on the elderly. Check on your parents. Spend time together. Try as much as you can not to congregate. Because we don't know what the future holds, but we want to do our best to honor those in authority over us. Here in the state of Maine, our governor, and then here in the United States, our president, and those of you that are around the world. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, to pray without ceasing. Jesus, before this section, had told the disciples, you guys can't even pray, so let's pray for one another. Let's pray for those in authority. And then finally, I want to remind you, we can trust God. In the book of Isaiah... In chapter 55, verses 8 to 11, I won't read it now, but you can read it. God says, my word will not return void. It will accomplish the purpose for which I sent it. And so we pray today that you've been blessed by the singing and the word of God. And I'm going to close this in a word of prayer. And I would just ask you, if, if you watch this and you don't know Christ, that today you would simply reach out. The Bible says, if we believe in our heart and confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, we will be saved. The Bible says we've all sinned. The Bible says that Jesus came. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And if you need to know more about that, you contact me. I'd love to talk to you, or you contact someone close to you. For the rest of you that know Jesus, I pray that you feel God's comfort. And so let's just close in a word of prayer right now. Father, thank you so much for this time that 20 years ago, we probably couldn't have done this. And so we thank you for the advances in technology. We pray right now for our president, for our governor here, for each person that's watching, and for people all around the world that are in leadership, that you give them great wisdom. We pray today that looking at this text, we'd be reminded that you love us, that you've not forgotten us, and that as we pick up next week with your son, the Lord Jesus, that it was our sins that sent him to the cross. And yet, that was not the end of the story. 
Friday started it, but Sunday was comfy because he would rise again. Thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen.